Welcome to the Strategy Mob Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy Mob. Today, I have a very special guest, just north of me, actually, and we've been meaning to connect for a while, and I'm so excited about our topics today. It is just going to be a blast to jam with Carla Sanzek. Carla, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, hang with me today. Hey, Jason, it's great to see you. It's good to see you, too. What a crazy <laughs> year, right? I know. And you know what? It's I don't know about you, but right now, this is like the coldest day that we've had. Oh, like, this yeah, year here, so too. Far. It's like minus 17. Like, it, my it dog is. this morning was like, I'm didn't even not want to go going outside. outside. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to like, go outside. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, it's finally here. But Mother Nature has spared us, so we're not buried in about three feet of snow like we usually are not in November. Yet, so. Not yet, but don't don't jinx us. We're going to get there. <laughs> hey, hey, Carla, I thought it'd be fun to uh, kick off today's podcast before we kind of get into our deep conversation with a little origin story. So so what is the origin story that is Carla Sonzak? Oh, my God. Well, we have to go back uh, a long time because uh, even though the Visual is a little blurred, which can hide my wrinkles. I've actually been in this industry for about 20, 25 years now. So this year I'm celebrating my 25th anniversary. Um, I was living in Vancouver in the 90s, which was amazing. Um, and I got recruited by Michelin Canada coming back to Quebec because I was, my husband and I were doing some Toyota racing out West. So we were always car people. We That's always cool. loved uh, you know, tinkering with engine, you know, when people went out on Saturday night to the bars, we went to the garage and hung around around an engine hoist. That, that is so cool. <laughs> so those are, those are our people. So when I got recruited, it was absolutely amazing. So Michelin um, came back to Montreal, worked for them for 12 years, and I took care of the um, car dealership in Eastern Ontario, some of them in the Maritimes and in Quebec and in Vancouver. And I was traveling a lot and really I was in sales, but as a young person, um, you know, selling a product is a lot about a lot more than just knowing your product. It's about is, teaching other people true. how to sell it. Right. So I spent a lot of times building trainings for service departments, parts departments, so that we can, you know, surf that tire wave that was coming our way in the late nineties, early two thousands. We wanted to keep more customers in the dealership past the three year service mark. Tires were a way to do that. Um, when we trained people, we, we took, uh, we took, a pulse and took a look at tire sales, brake sales, alignment sales afterwards, and everything was spiking. So I started doing spring and fall. I think by the time I was 30 and I had my first daughter, I had trained about <laughs> 4,000 to 5,000 people in Canada wow. on the service side of things when it comes to demonstrating value and really talking to the consumer about you know, obviously a good, better, best, but we want to start with the best because we want to have their best interest at heart. So I went on to the sales side of things with Auto Trader, mm -hmm. and uh, that was amazing because that, you know, I got to go to the US, I got to work with dealer.com. We got to see in 2008 when we all got hit over the head with a stick, uh, what was happening to the consumer journey in terms of going more online. So, really exciting time, you know, websites becoming uh, more friendly, the user experience mm -hmm. becoming fantastic. Um, except for when all these leads were pushed to dealers, the responses kind of sounded like, uh, you know, Robert De Niro in 1991. Uh, so lead response, I started focusing there. And I left Auto Trader six years ago to start uh, my own company dealing with dealer groups, uh, manufacturers and single rooftops to really put together highly quality responses to leads depending on the situation follow-up process and how to improve overall digital communication because whether you're dealing with leads or maturities or the service customer, it's all going to come down and much more so today than ever on how you can communicate via email, phone, video, text, and all the platforms that we're adding on. So, so that's my story. And after, you know, six years, it's been about 
2,000 participants. So that's a lot of participants, but that's all face-to-face. So now the business, of course, is shifting online. So I look forward to continuing to provide lead management training, but in a studio such as yourself, Jason. So there's my story for you. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. You know, I, it, this is truly one of those industries that, you know, kind of gets in your blood and you had it very <laughs> early on. I think you probably oh, had gosh, gasoline yeah. in your blood. So, yeah, you I know, had- I, I was kind of the same way. Like, like cars were just kind of a thing. In fact, I remember oh. my, me, me and my dad, we, uh, we sold baseball carts on the road. Uh, back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, right? And it was really big. I mean, it was just a big, big thing. And I remember even then just playing like games where it's like we would identify the car driving towards us. And, you know, of course, as the sun went down, it would get harder and harder. You'd have to start identifying the car just by the silhouette of it or its headlights. So, yeah, I mean, you know what's funny? I can even still do that today. You know, oh, something it's like so a, cool, right? A little I Chrysler mean, K car coming down the road. I'm like, I know which one that is. But, yeah, it's I, I do find like that, that is kind of a consistent pattern I find with a lot of us in the automotive yeah. industry. We just always had, had a big Love passion it. for it. and and I, But I think that passion is what keeps us going. And this kind of leads into the discussion that we're having today is that, you know, our passion is not just our passion is for the dealership, which yeah. thus just makes our passion for the, for, for the customer. You know, oh and, and, you know, I, I there, there's look, it, it's it's 2021 and we're still talking about how to connect, you know, that customer uh, expectations and experience. And, you know, uh, it's on one like one side. I'm like, are we still really talking about this? Like we still have to have conversation. The other side of me, it's like, hey, it is what it is. We got to have this conversation. So let's start with that, because I think, you know what? Uh, customers expectations has changed in just a huge, huge way in the last <laughs> nine months. Probably has more, yeah, right? Probably more than the last nine months, and it has in the last probably forty years combined. So, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on kind of how you see that customer expectations have changed in the last nine months. Well, I mean, it's definitely sped things up, right? I mean, we knew that even before this pandemic, a lot more people were going online. A lot more mm-hmm, people were mm-hmm. sending out forms, reaching out to us through different ways. Social was starting to be a thing, you know, Facebook Marketplace launched like three years ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot more traffic was coming through there. And, and, and of course, you know, we have those stories about waiting for the up bus, right? <laughs> Things <laughs> like that. But, yeah. you know, more and more people, like I remember when I started working with dealers on this side of things, on the training side of things. You know, there was maybe 10 or 15 percent of the business that was coming in from online uh, after this nine last nine months. I mean, we're we're looking at 50 to 60 percent in some cases of the business coming from that uh, from that source. Right. From that oh, traffic yeah. source. Um, and, and it's it's not a different customer. You know, it's the same customer that used to come in or used to call. But with everything that's happened. Uh, we know that customer have wanted to do more at a distance for a while, right? Oh, like, let's sure. not kid ourselves, right? Uh, although you have an urge as a salesperson to just say, you know, well, when can you come in? We can do so much more here. We can evaluate your trade. We can come up with pricing. Well, customers have been wanting this information before they come in, right? And oh, the pandemic absolutely. has just caused us to rip the Band-Aid, right? So in terms of providing some of the obstacles that stand in the way of the customer uh, a little bit more at a distance. So through digital, through video, through text messaging, uh, the messages from the last nine months is we need to remove every single obstacle that we used to put in the way of the customer to slow them down, (laughs) to speed them up, right? Well, you know what? I Um, I just read some recently some really cool stats on that, actually. You know, there was a study actually done here in Canada of right around 20,000, you know, in-market shoppers. And, you know, 67% of them said that, you know, they would like to start the process, you know, online. They they didn't say they wanted to buy the car. No. But their expectation was is that they could at least start the process online. And and the two big desires and factors for that was was convenience. And the other one was just they felt like it would be less pressure when they came into the dealership if they were able to do more prior to coming in. You kind of do you feel the same thing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, that's always been our theory and our vision that if you help them remove those obstacles on their own term, you're, you're, you're going to open up communication and, and it's a probabilities game, right? I mean, we are talking about sales. This is not new, you know, follow up on your prospects, 
provide them with value, yeah. always have something for them to take a look at and keep the communication going. But in terms of what's happening, in terms of you know, evaluating their trade, there's a few things that customers want to do before coming in. And, and, and if I could say to a salesperson, I usually start the training with that is um, in terms of when you get an email, there's a message that's written there. And, and it's written white on white. So sometimes you can't read it, but you got to assume it's there. Mm -hmm. If I'm sending you an email, it's because I'm not ready to come in yet. That's very so, true. you know, there's that customer saying, I have an interest. I have a few questions before I move forward. Who's going to provide me with clear communication content so that I can bring my decision forward? And it's all about differentiating ourselves, right? So they're going to send out five or six inquiries. You know, some of them are not even going to get responded to. Can you I, believe I love, that's I love the fact still that, happening I in love 2021? The fact that you said inquiries. Like, you know, I, I know, like, I can sometimes get a stickler for language. Um, but I love the fact that you said inquiries because, I, you know, that that's what we, you know, when I kind of first started in this business, you know, my, one of my first roles was, you know, director of internet operations because they had no idea what the hell else to call me. And, you know, um, but, but we called them we call them inquiries because that's legitimately what they are. I don't know where and at what point in time in our industry we started changing these things and calling them leads because then the, the, For I think measurement the, the dealerships purposes, expectations. I make sure you got to bucket them all in. Right? Like it, it's crazy. Yeah. It's absolutely no, no. You said one other thing, and I just like because again, it's something that blows my mind today, right? That, you know, I think, you know, a lot of dealerships out there are probably on their 15th, 20th, maybe. 25th year of having a website, depending how early they bought yeah. into a website. Sure. But don't you think it's still insane that the only two forms of communications that we really give as an option when it comes to filling out a form is, you know, email? I mean, who the hell uses yeah. email in the first place? And then, and then phone? Like, I mean, look, everybody knows. In fact, you even did it yourself. Everybody knows. You don't call me if you want to get a hold of me. If, if you do, I'll call it. I'll yeah. call you back in the next 24 hours. If you email me, it's going to be probably 48 hours. But if you LinkedIn message me, you know, you just you did that just before we started. You, you got a car. You, you got a response immediately. So don't you think it's weird that we haven't embraced that in our websites? Well, it's it's it, it is weird, but it's also typical at the same time because we are <laughs> yeah, slow to true. adopt. I mean, as an industry, we are slow to adopt uh, in terms of CRM. Let's just use that example. You know, business to business, whether you're a pharmaceutical rep, whether you're going out there working for the telecom companies, you've had to deal with a CRM. And nobody's going to show up at a pharmaceutical meeting and say, well, I'm not going to use the CRM because I have an Excel spreadsheet and I have everybody in my cell phone and that's how I'm going to work. Right. <laughs> that's true. They would say get the fuck out. <laughs> that is exactly what they would say. <laughs> but in auto, we, we tolerated this, right? We tolerated this for so long uh, that now I think is really the time to take a look at, you know, what we do, how people contact us. Video is growing. FaceTime is growing. You know, chat on the website, like not you know, somebody who's just there to ask the customer 35 times for their name, blood know, type right? and That's, telephone number, is, but somebody who's actually there to say, Hey, you know, <laughs> you're interested in this vehicle. Great. Let me connect you to a product specialist. Like, like Hi, actually I'm, have a Carla, real conversation. I'm here. <laughs> I'm at the store. You know, I'm not in India. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about the pooling capacity on that GMC Duramax. Right. So you know, we have to be careful on all these buttons we're putting on. Like, I think web form is old school. Like you said, we need to have it. I think it's a necessary evil, but certainly sure. only having those options on your website, uh, you know, phone and email. That's kind of archaic in the world where we live, where really our responsibility is to communicate with our customers throughout their preferred method of communication, not ours. Right. You know I, I love the fact that you say that because, you know, we're talking about kind of customer expectations. And I find that there's 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 a lot of little micro events as far as their expectations now, but the the overall umbrella of what the customer expects now, you know, especially this year, is they, they want to feel like they're in the driver's seat. They yeah. want to feel like yeah. they're in control, you know. And I, I, but I'm curious, kind of how 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 do you kind of translate that out? What what do you think it means to have the customer in control of the experience? <laughs> Well, listen, I mean, in sales, we talk about giving control or giving the illusion of control. Let's not forget our sales <laughs> training, right? Yep. So there's a lot of strategies you can use 
customers do want to feel in control. And that's not really rocket science because if you look at ourselves, like I want to talk to everybody that's listening now, look at yourself as a customer. What are your expectations in terms of communication when you want to add, an ad, um, you know, another house to your insurance co company, or you mm -hmm. want to refinance mm -hmm. your mortgage, or you want to call a contractor out to set up, you know, an extension on your house. What are your expectations when it comes to customer service, when it comes to clarity, when it comes to sharing estimates, right? When it comes to providing proof that, you know, you're the right person for the job. So it's not difficult to imagine what customers' expectations are. They're, they want a quick uh, interaction because time is the most precious commodity oh, to us sure. all. They want to be able to have more than what they're asking for. They want to be enlight enlightened and they also want to be entertained as well in, in terms of this is an exciting time. They're considering a vehicle, right? So we have to position the value of that particular piece of metal or that particular service that they're asking about, whether it's subprime, whether it's uh, evaluating their trade. And we have to bring them to the next level of commitment, right? So in terms of you know, how we communicate going forward, I think it's very important for us to really this year tell our customers that we will do it according to their preferred method, whether they're a chatter, whether they're a texter, whether they want us to uh, maybe do a video walk around for them, send it later on so they can enjoy it with their wife at home mm -hmm. or over the weekend. You know, we have to be ready to say, hey, I'm here, but I'm here based on how you would like to work with us for your automotive needs. And that's not my need. That's not my manager telling me I need a freaking 48% conversion rate. Yeah, to exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you know, you know, what I th you know, what I think is interesting is, um, you know, kind of the same study, uh, kind of going, what we were talking about here, that same study that I was reading, I, I, what I thought was really surprised. One of the questions they asked is, you know, would the consumer, would you be you know willing to fill out uh, credit applications before coming yeah. into the dealership? And I was blown away with this stat because it sounded incredibly high to me, but I'm sure there's some truth to it. 72% were willing to fill out uh, something to do with financing or credit because, again, they felt like it was going to save them time yeah. and there was going to be less pressure around, you know, when it came to the F&I side of the business. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like, I, I just feel like, look, I'm originally from the States. And, you know, I remember when I, when I first moved up here, you know, I was already used to a very, you know, finance Digitized first car. Process. Yeah, I was, already, I was already used to kind of a finance first and car second kind of a meth, meth, mentality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like Canadians, we're, we're still, we're kind of, we're behind in that space, you know? Or it's very like, leery. I mean, you take a look that, at the castle laws, right? Like take a look Good at, point. you know, our privacy policies and things like this. Canadians are more conservative when it comes to communication. Uh, that's why, that's another reason why communication needs to be high quality. Uh, communications are a little, uh, Canadians are a little leery as well in terms of giving their phone numbers away, being contacted, things like this. So that's why, you know, your initial reply, your initial value proposition needs to be strong, needs to make a strong impression. Um, but in terms of, of, you know, online, like I think a lot of dealerships, a lot of salespeople, or even F&I are afraid of moving to those platforms because they, they think they're going to lose some of those, you know, opportunities to, to show the customer a product. But what, when you show the customer your whole menu and you make that customer, you know, become the owner of that transaction and they built it themselves, that's how they take ownership, exactly. right? So you talk about making the customer feel in control. In digital communication, sometimes it's as easy as, you know, I hear a lot of people in service, you know, how would you like to pay for your repair? You know, I simply try to get them to turn that into, would you prefer to pay by credit card or by interact? Right. So it's all about how we put ourselves out there to make the customer feel like they are in control, that they have a choice. And, and when we tell them what we can do for them, right. So for example, you know, you get a lead and they talk about, hey, I've got a 2012 Honda Accord. Can you give me an estimate on that trade value? Mm -hmm. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the Hyundai Tucson, whatever, whatever. And we focus on the Tucson, right? We're not focusing on the trade. Hey, we'd love to take your trade. When can you come in so that my yeah. pre-owned manager can take a look at your vehicle, right? So then the customer stops reading. 
right then and there because the customer is no longer in control. He want you want him to go in, you want him to show up so that you can evaluate the car. Changing the game and becoming customer centric is knowing that things like that bother the shit out of customers. So try to well, look, offer. I mean, look, and- it, it bothers the shit out of everybody. Like, uh-huh. I mean, that's the kicker. I don't know. I don't know why we keep see- thinking that like customers are different than us because we're all consumers, no, right? That's right? But when you're talking to a dealership, like, oh, customers, I'm like, bullshit. You would do the exact. St- you would do the exact same thing, you know. And like, and, and we are talking. You know, that kind of goes into kind of the, you know, the 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 process, the experience. Kind of another topic that we were talking about today, is you know that that experience starts with communication. That's right. And, and I think the customer is expecting to have some level of control of the communication, the frequency of that communication. And, and that starts that process. I, I, too often, I think that dealers think that the experience is just kind of like this mythical, like, you know, dragon or unicorn that everyone's trying it's to. It's going to cost uh, us so much money. It's going to cost us a lot of money. Right? It's, it's, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of resources. When, when in reality, an experience is all these little tiny things. And we can process the crap out of these little tiny things, you know, and I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, how do we process the experience? Well, I mean, again, comes back down to communication. I was listening to your show a little earlier on this week. They were talking about the fact that, that, you know, they're training some people in terms of how to to behave in front of a customer when you're customer facing, right? Because those people are not going to be taking leads or, but, you know, if we realize that, you know, we are consumers, our consumers are just like us, you know, yes, some people are going to prefer to come into the dealership. Yes. Some people are going to be ready. They're going to come into the dealership a lot more ready. If you prep them in advance with some great communication, video content, and your close is going to be that much higher. If you paved the way for that, if you keep in your card close the way we used to do it when it comes to payment examples, when it comes to trade evaluation, I mean, the simple word estimate, like let's not make a big deal out of this. I'm going to provide you with an estimate for your vehicle based on the market value. Do you have some time today to discuss that with me at 3.30? Moving that customer to the next level of communication, um, everybody's got to improve their communication. That's going to be the game changer going forward. So whether you're handling leads, whether you're handling phones, whether you're in person, there will be some digital communication aspect to your follow-up with that customer, whether they buy or not, whether they need more information, whether you want a referral from them. This is where people can really improve their games going forward is by focusing in on that. The better you communicate through all these tools that are not facing the better you're going to build the trust, the more your customers are going to respond to you and the more you're going to close. So it's a mathematical formula and it all starts with the quality of communications we put out there. It, so. it really is quality of the communication. I'll give you kind of a, a cool story. I have a dealership doing this. And again, what it is, is, you know, um, they, they first talked about the process and then worked backwards, you know, to the technology and they wanted the customer customer to be more connected during that time frame, you know, between signature and and picking up the car. What they were running into is they they were running into some buyer remorse or concerns or something along that lines. And they had to figure out a way to, you know, to kind of adjust that. So they 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 first defined what they wanted in the process, right? They wanted the the customer to feel connected to the delivery. So it was all the steps that were going on and the things that were happening. So I thought what was really cool. What they did is they actually created a WhatsApp group for every oh, car for awesome. every car that they delivered. So for every car that they delivered, they created a WhatsApp group, you know, that had the F9 manager on it, salesperson on it, the general manager on it, and then the service manager on it. And in this F9 and in the WhatsApp, you know, titling would be the stock number of the, of the car. And you know, the the customer would actually see the conversation going cool. on between the departments as things were happening. So the service manager goes, "Yep, we're getting oh. it. We're getting its PDI done right now. Uh, detailing should be done on Thursday around 2 p.m." And you know, it was now. Of course, not everybody knows this. The customers there and seeing and watching it, but then the customer can also, you know, engage oh, in, in, yeah. in the conversation as well and talk about connecting. You know, oh and, look, and this is free tech. You know, but what it is is they wanted an experience. Right. They set a goal. They set a goal. The goal was cl- the goal was clear. They wanted um, they wanted better CSI. They wanted higher confidence 
in the consumer once they've made the purchase. You know, I guess I don't know why they were running into issues behind buyer's remorse, but they are. I know for any of our American listeners out there, um, here we, we it takes us uh, at least two to three days to actually deliver a vehicle. I know that sounds crazy. Yeah, I know, is, I know. I know. It is to my what it is. In Georgia, and they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's like two hours. The customer, you know, it's, forty-five it's, minutes in Florida, <laughs> burning gas and you know, killing bugs. Um, but yeah, that's it's just not the case up there. So I thought this was a really cool, uh, really cool example of how someone can process the experience through communication. I thought you get a kick out of it. Now, now let's talk a little I bit. That. I want to go back a little bit. And I want to kind of talk about a little bit about right. consumer behavior trends. You know, yeah. because I, I think right. there's there's some new ones that have come up or, or things have changed. So I'd love to kind of get your thought how some of those consumer yeah. trends and how they've changed, you know, kind of, you know, buying behavior. Well, buying behavior, I think the two key words I want people to remember today is uh, simplification. Simplification. So making things easier for the customer. That's what they're looking for. They're looking to uh, get connected, get pricing, get questions answered, get video visuals in order to be able to make a decision to come in, in order to be able to make a decision to make an appointment or whatever else. So simplification is one of the one of the things that behavior that we're looking at in terms of new customer behavior. We we per, we take a look at that in terms of what was happening before where you had about 35% of people pulling the trigger on a decision for a vehicle within 30 days. Now you have 57% of people pulling the decision within 30 days. So it's almost, you know, 75% more than before. So it's accelerated. So the need, you know, they're, they're making decisions quicker throughout this, you know, past year, but what they want is for us to simplify that process. So in terms of evaluating their trade, in terms of, you know, showing them examples of leasing versus financing, what does a 48 month look like versus a 72, you know, what can we do mm -hmm, for them? Mm -hmm. And I really like the example that you just gave about the group on WhatsApp, because what these guys are doing is actually making the customer realize that it takes a village to deliver a car. Well, and well that was the other thing too. Yeah, should, absolutely. And that's what we should be putting out there because the customer is not going to see the value in terms of only having a relationship with one person at your dealership, right? So how everyone communicates, you know, you buy a vehicle, customers don't realize sometimes that, you know, that dealership employs 40 to 100 to 200 people. That's, you know, 40 to 100 to 200 of your neighbors in your community with their kids that play hockey with yours. Like this is a really great business. And when customers go in there trying to squeeze everything out of the dealer, it's because they haven't seen the value. So if we can do activities like the one you just talked about, where we implicate the customer into the delivery, which is the most exciting time, right? Like, oh, yeah, I mean, come I on, how jacked do you have to be? In the past that they did their F and I at delivery. And I'm like, that is what? such a buzzkill. Okay. What are you doing? right? Delivery should be fun. If the customer is involved, if you can use video and communication to make that customer involved, whether it's a photo of the vehicle coming off the boat in Halifax or Vancouver oh, no. or See, whatever that's, I mean, that was just kind of the other things they can put into, you know, that WhatsApp, they were putting in oh, videos of saying, yeah. Hey guys, it's ready. Look, just come out of detail. Like, I mean, talk about, like I said, it didn't cost me anything. Right. And, 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 and the cool thing is this, this WhatsApp chat group, um, we actually found that uh, the customers were actually continuing to use it even after the delivery. Oh, that's brilliant. So, so even that's after brilliant. the delivery, they got home and they were like, hey, I, I, I'm, I, I can't remember what you told me. What does this button do again? Oh, what, what's, this, phone again? <laughs> what's this light? Where's this light? You know, and it was like the cool thing is because you had the service manager and you had the part and you had the, um, the the sales manager and the salesperson on there. So whoever was available to jump in and have the conversation, they could have it. So they really felt like it was a community effort in the delivering and the servicing of that. And I just thought, what what an amazing process to, to you know, to an experience. Oh. To totally. And the more you use these tools, I mean, because, because that, that sales process has shortened, right? So we have 57% of people buying within the first 30 days. We've got the rest of them spread over, you know, month one to three, that's the next wave of about 20%. And then the rest of them are contacting you are only going to pull the trigger after day 90 and between, you know, six months, right? So in terms of longevity, in terms of keeping the customer engaged, all these little things like that contribute to the fact that we want the customer to feel that it's not 
not just about the metal. It's about how we have their back where it comes to service, when it comes to finance. You know, we're not passing the buck around when they have a salesperson. That's, that person is, you know, needs to adapt and become an account manager, right, for that customer yes, and exactly. oversee every aspect. And technology surely allows us to give the customer visibility on all the brilliant things we do at the dealership behind the scenes to make that a special experience, right? So, Well, you know, the other thing, too, is they actually increased their uh, accessory sales. Because what <laughs> yeah. was happening was is there was this open form of communication, this open group of conversation. So, you know, even it was funny, even some of the customers were engaging with the with the chat group months after the vehicle yeah, had been it, delivered. Right? And it was just like and they actually sh screenshot showed me one. They're like, hey, hey, guys, I'm um, we're, we're going we're going skiing um, and I'm not I don't know exactly which uh, ski rack works on, you know, my new Murano. Um, you know, which, you know, which one should you do? And, and of course, you know, then the service manager chimes in and say, oh, well, you know, we actually are a Thule certified you know, dealer, we actually have those things in stock. If you want to come by, the guy responds back, great. I'll, I'll be I'm there away. tomorrow. <laughs> Didn't even ask about the price. No. Just straight up said, perfect. I'm, I'm coming. He, need, he needs a Thule. He needs a ski rack. He's exactly. going skiing. The exactly. price is not first on his mind, right? So too often, I think we, we, th we, we get bogged down by, oh, you know, I have, like we said before, you know, an inquiry. I'm, I have a lead. I'm going to sell a car, my conversion rate. Right. But you have to bring that customer through a process of decision making and you have to make yourself available to them and you have to communicate brilliantly. Um, you know, I see so much stuff go out there sometimes that's just not thought out. And we are in a world of communication, whether industry you're talking about, right? Like you get emails from your kids schools, right? Oh, yeah, like totally. is the title, you know, optimized is the introduction, pretty solid like what's going out there what are you expecting as a customer that's what your customers are expecting out there uh, you know today we have a meeting jason we have each other in the calendar right so <laughs> yeah, how many yeah. of our customers out there only live with a calendar right so when you're booking an appointment with them when you're trying to schedule a home test drive when you're trying to get them in for service we need to be using those same tools that the customer is using to save themselves time and make it part of our process as well. Uh, that's true. You know, I'm actually surprised to see how often, you know, as a, as a dealership, we'll schedule an appointment with someone and then we don't send them a uh, actual appointment invite, you know, I, so I they can add up. into it. But isn't it mind boggling? Like I, I've... Oh my God, Jason, I wouldn't pick up my kids if it wasn't in my calendar. If, if like, it, this and is this happens to me all the time. If it's not in my calendar, I, I just... I wouldn't simply do it, but it's just, it's, it's great because, you know, that has that built in, like, again, this is like, we're not talking about going out and spending thousands of dollars on new tech. What we're talking about is creating, you know, buyer centric processes. All right. And develop and really documenting those processes, then working backwards towards technology so we can actually execute on these things. But I do want to go a little farther into, you know, what it means to be buyer centric because I, Buzzwords. buyer centric right we you say know, that word like a lot say it all what does it time. mean to be buyer centric uh, we you know we have these trendy words that come out once in a while um you know i'll talk to you about michelin a little bit in terms of buyer centricity mm -hmm. uh when they got to north america in the 70s you know they wanted their tires which were premium to be only at certain locations right because the location had to be clean it had to be this it had to be that the experience was very important Important. We only directed Michelin customers to those types of places. The 80s came around, the 90s came around, and these big companies that have been around for 100 years became buyer-centric before us in automotive kind of knew what that meant. And that meant listening to the customer, and that meant, you know, having Michelin tires at Canadian Tire and Costco, having them in our mm -hmm. car dealership where the customer's already bringing their cars in. Becoming buyer-centric is doing everything possible to make it easy for the customer to deal with our brand in a way that, you know, enriches their experience and in a way where we demonstrate value beyond our product. Uh, nobody walks into an Apple store with the expectation of getting a grumpy face, right? So, no, no, you know, don't. people in product go hand in hand. Becoming buyer centric means taking a look at the data. What are customers expecting? They're expecting speed. They're expecting answers. 
They want pricing. They want to know about your incentives. They want to see the car before coming in. Sometimes they don't want to come in. Sometimes they do. You have to read that data in order to formulate your responses and your follow-up strategies so that you sound like the customer wants you to sound finally. So mm -hmm. becoming mm -hmm. buyer-centric is taking ourselves out of the equation and how many things we have to book and deliver in this beyond the 30 days of our cycle in automotive and taking a look at our customer as our book of business how can we expand it? And really, honestly, how to expand that is through communication, it's through frequent follow-up, it's through value, it's through video, it's oh, through sure. generating exciting opportunities for the customer to participate in the dealership culture. So there's my spiel for you. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, it is, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, but I think we got to go a little deeper, though, when it comes to like being buyer-centric. I love how Michelin did it. And, and I think we can learn a lot from that, you know. But, you know, I, I think of like, what does it mean to be buyer centric, like in the service department? In you know, the because like, department. look, when I think of service, you know, like we, we spend just an obscene amount of time talking about retention. Oh, no, sure. I, and and, yes, and we, God bless those people. <laughs> right. And we, we don't seem to spend enough time talking about acquisition. And I feel like the, you know, the, the companies out there that really are truly buyer centric in their efforts, all right, seem to kind of have this almost kind of built in acquisition strategy. You know, so so how does like what does it mean to you to be buyer centric within a service department? Well, it means having the customers back, right? So they trusted mm -hmm. you, they bought the car here, right? So now here's their, you know, here's their pit crew. <laughs> First of all, you introducing your customer to the pit crew. Uh, that are going to have their back, that are going to be taking a call five minutes before they close because they're stuck somewhere with a flat. Those are the guys that are going to have the customers back. So in terms of becoming buyer centric in service, we have to basically make sure our salespeople bring our customers to service when it comes to introducing them to the department that works hand in hand with sales to make sure their vehicle is, is ready uh, for winter, whatever it is. And becoming buyer centric in service also means you know letting go of some of the old style technology or old style way of thinking oh mrs jones i have uh some news about your vehicle could you please call me back <laughs> at the dealership i want to discuss it with you screw that right like we need to send a text we need to you know make a video about what needs to be done on the car show the customer why we're proposing this type of service and then get them to agree to it and, and, and base it on whatever uh, method of communication they're using, right? Whether it's, you know, you can introduce mobile pay, whether you can tell your customers that you can pick up the vehicle, becoming buyer centric, especially in a time like this of pandemic where people are a little bit leery about going into commercial spaces is providing and telling the customer about everything we can do that's non-typical, whether it's picking up their car at work or home, whether it's valet service, whether it's, you know, contactless service, mobile pay, all these things. Yes. Uh, that's, that's what we need to do. And we need to circle those messages out through social media so that people know that it's not just about the metal, it's about a village making sure they have a customer's back, right? Well, and it's right, it's it's having the customer's back. And you, you said something a little earlier that really got me thinking too, is you know the, the amount of data points that oh, we collect gosh. at a dealership is, is absolutely just just crazy, right? And and I feel like sometimes we don't do enough to digitalize that. But you know, like I, I'll give you for example, like let's say a customer comes in and we measure their tire depth. Look, we do this all the time. It's a pretty common process, right? And yeah. they come in and it's at five millimeters. Well, we know that's getting pretty pretty dang close, right? But we also know, you know, based on how many times this person's come in, they're kind of average mileage. We know that between to go from five millimeters down to three millimeters, we may only be talking less than 10,000 kilometers worth of driving. So, you know, th this is where I think, you know, buyer centric kind of kicks in. It's like, this is where I make that note in the system that, yeah. that, that, that in ensures that the next time they come in, right? The first thing that we talk about, our first thing I have ready is their tire quote. You know, I'll, I'll prep them for the conversation in advance. Look, Mr. Customer, you're at five millimeters, All right? We, we're going what to have- What that means exactly. is, right? We're going yeah. to have this conversation next time you come in, okay? And, you know, because based on how you drive, we're expecting that you're going to have this kind of wear. But it's being proactive. See, I, that's where I see. I, I, yeah. think, I think, you know, some of, the, some of the businesses that I do business with, you know, um, or I purchase from regularly, right, they're proactive in it. You know, I think of, um, I have one of those Nespresso coffee machines. Yeah. You, you, have, you have one? 
Yeah, I have one. Yes, I'm I'm bankrupt and I have one. Yes. <laughs> I know. No kidding. Man. It so does does make it does make it. Yeah, man, it does make a damn good cup of coffee though. I will I will admit I do like it. You know, but I love that. See, I'm a I I do all my ordering online, right? Yeah. And they actually have data on me on how often I order and how much I order. So What's they actually proactively, yeah, they actually, and it's almost kind of weird sometimes. Like they'll yeah, proactively, it's Orwellian a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll proactively reach out to me and say, hey, you're, you're probably running a little low. All right, do you just want to go ahead and just hit the resubmit button on what you ordered last time? And I'm like going, gosh, that's buyer centric. I mean, talk about really making it easy yeah. for me to do business with you. And right. you know, that, I feel like dealers can can do more of that. You know, let's talk about buyer centric on the sales side. So, so kind of keeping that in mind, how can a sales department be buyer centric and make it easier for the customer to do business with us? Well, by by telling them how easy it is to do business with us. I mean, we've been claiming it's easy to do business with us, but is it really easy? Right? <laughs> That's very is it, true. Is it really easy? Because because I'll tell you right now, I have a lot of friends in real estate, and it's easier to buy a house in Canada than it is to buy a car sometimes. Oh, right? oh absolutely, hundred percent. So. Becoming buyer centric is 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 being conscious of the fact that you know people's time is precious. There's you know we live in the automotive industry. You and I we eat, breathe, love it. We draw probably dream about it and things like that. Wake I up do, in the I morning do. all yep. rear and to go. Mm -hmm. That's our life. That's not our customer's life. You know they're engineers, they're accountants, they have kids, they have hockey. They they're working from home all of a sudden where they didn't work from home before. They're using delivery services that they never used before. Becoming buyer centric is looking where customers are being engaged, so we know video is strong, right? Video is probably the most important thing you can do in order to make a customer want or not want that car, right? That is like 46% of customers told us that video is actually what pushed them towards a yes or no. Uh, so becoming buyer centric is reading that data. Like you said, like we, we use our data to do our ads. We do, you know, bookings, we, we, we do our image at our dealership, we use our data for that stuff, but we need to use that data as well. If people want to save time, well, we need to provide them with a process that's centered around text, video, uh, digital communication, at home uh, test drives, at home service. Becoming buyer centric means we are no longer going to make you you know, come in and do what we want you to do. We're going to go to you and here's how we do it. And here's what our customers are saying about it and why they love it. So it comes back down to what is your preferred method of communication, Mr. Customer? And that's how we're going to work with you. That's the easiest way to get buyer centric. Just take yourself out of that equation. And if you become more in line with how your customers want to work with you, because if you do have an existing book of business, you know mm. who these people are. Oh, Hopefully sure. you have a sales manager that taught you one time that, you know, you need to know what your people do for a living, right? So you, <laughs> you can appreciate where they're coming from. So, you know, reaching out to them when you're keeping that relationship going after the sale, knowing they're a busy entrepreneur or they're a, they have a catering company or whatever it is, you know, telling them everything that you can do and answering their questions digitally, you know, being there for them around the holidays, uh, the dealership's still open, we can assist you. Positioning what you can do for them that requires the least amount of time and provides them with great answers, that's what buyer-centric is all about. Well, you know, look, I, when it comes to the BDC, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I look, I think the original model of the BDC was to be buyer centric and was to be customer centric. And then at some point in time over the years, somehow that got put into just dial for dollars. And, and, and we lost that actual like the customer service yeah, part of BDC, yeah. you know, and and, you know, look, I, I know that you've worked for some amazing companies that are uh, that have had that mentality around really being customer centric and on the phone and in person. So I'd love to kind of get your thoughts then on, you know, how does a BDC, you know, maintain that buyer centric, you know, kind of mentality and not lose it? Well, I mean, you know, a BDC is a great opportunity, right? Unfortunately, a lot of people do BDC, like you just said, with a way of just trying to get that customer to that appointment, trying to not share that much information and filter everything for our sales guys. So they only get the creme de la creme. You know, a BDC needs to become based on product knowledge. It needs to become, you know, inside sales. That's what it is. That's what exactly. a BDC should be, where you're informing the customer about technologies, you're answering their question, you're able to provide 
MSRP payment, Ooh, <laughs> dollars and numbers, right? Without involving someone else. Uh, and, and if there is a complicated situation, that's where BDC can escalate that and work with sales in order to move that customer through their decision-making process. But you know, somewhere we 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 unfortunately shit the bed with BDC uh, and just turned them into receptionists, like glorified receptionists, right? Yeah, and that's just turn not them to where like they need center. to be. Yeah, yeah, we need to basically enable our BDC to act as inside sales. I mean, I'm not saying we're going to be negotiating price through the BDC, but again, I'm of the school of, you know, I dream of the day I will throw a party when we stop negotiating for the price of a car. <laughs> like this is completely uh, 1984 and it shouldn't happen anymore. And the more value we provide to the customer, the more transparency, the more clarity, the more great touch points, whether it's BDC, whether it's sales, whether it's service, that customer is going to see our value go up and that price negotiation is not going to make any sense anymore, right? So, Oh, no, and for sure. Look, at the end of the day, I think if you, your business is really going to be buyer slash customer centric, then, you know, every individual in your business needs to be prepared to handle whatever situation there oh, is. The silos you know, need to break down. And that's, right? kind of, that's kind of what, you know, and I think, look, the overall theme of this entire podcast has been that, right? Like if, if you're going to provide an experience, you're going to process your way to it. If you're going to be buyer centric, you're going to process your way to it, you know, but you first have to have the desire to actually want to, you know, because you wow. can sit here and listen to us talk and watch us and, you know, you can nod yeah. your head up and down, but if you don't take that first step and actually develop all this process, you're not going to go anywhere. Now, Carla, I know it's getting towards the tail end of our time. And, you know, before I, before I let you go, I think for, you know, everybody out there that's watching and listening right now and have just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today when would like it's to, a lot of fun. yeah, it has been a lot of fun. And, you know, for those who'd like to connect with you and learn more about what you do and kind of follow along with your journey, you know, what, what is the best way to do that? Oh, listen, I mean, you can check us out on uh, www.upinmotion.com. That's our website, but check me out as well on LinkedIn, Carla Sonzek, and uh, our Facebook page. We're uh, excited to go into the future, uh, you know, uh, going forward with online webinars, online video. We're a company that's been all over Canada and some parts of the U.S. in person, but we're going to bring that knowledge going forward to uh, online webinars, live sessions, so we can have a greater reach. So if you're interested in uh, tuning up this Q1 and making sure that you go out there with a really great game face on to handle all your digital communication and your operating rhythm for follow-ups, we'd sure love to connect with you uh, sometime, in, uh, sometime in the year. So look out for us online. That's awesome. Hey, hey, Carla, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me today. This has been an absolute blast. You have yourself an amazing day. You too, Jason. See you soon. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy Mob Podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to sign up to be a mobster at strategymob.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. 